and the AUSN students. So for today, I'll be wearing my hat as one of the uh, students of AUSN. So uh, my paper or the thesis is uh, consists of more than 200 pages, but I will be presenting it only in 20 minutes. So uh, let me do it. Let me do magic. Okay, to start with, uh, the title of my thesis is Traditional Healing Practices of Ind Indigenous People in the Philippines, Its Implications to Academic Discourse and MAP Extension Services Program. Okay. Table of Contents, so it consists of uh, 10 chapters as shown on the slide. Introduction about Philippine Indigenous Community, Literature Review and Theoretical Framework, Methodology about Identity, its concept, Agency concept, Representation concept, Medicinal Plants and Uses, Perception of MAP and AUSN students, and Finding Summary, Conclusion and Recommendation. For the introduction, this consists of background and rationale, scope and aims of the thesis, methodology, organization of the thesis, importance of the thesis, and limitation. Okay, a brief backgrounder and rationale. So having been in Wa'a for the past 17 years as its executive dean and director for research and extension services and now as its external religious director, I have been exposed to some of the indigenous groups of the Philippines called ETA. ETA being one of the beneficiaries in MAP Extension Services programs, I'm also aware how some of them were displaced from their own ancestral land, whereas some of them have been adopted by some non-government organization to improve their quality of life. MAP is located in Mariveles, Bataan, in a location close to the Eta community in Mariveles, Morong, and Bagak. Part of our extension services is to provide livelihood training and projects to the Eta community and opportunity to teach and play with the children. This experience has taught me how to respect Eta's. I had the privilege of seeing most of their medicinal and herbal plants grown within their community as well as their healing practices and traditions. I knew that they possess great knowledge and wisdom. As one of the invited visiting professor of the American University of Sovereign Nations, I had the pleasure and opportunity in August 2014 to visit, meet, and link with the Navajo and Apache tribes in Arizona, USA, and had visited various museums and tribal communities. Now this thesis aims to document the traditional knowledge and practices of the Eta community represented by Sitio Matalangnao in Barangay Banawang Bagak Bataan. In so doing, all the knowledge, information, and courseworks acquired from AUSN from April 2014 to date may be shared utilized and created in a form of a new knowledge to better understand the indigenous peoples, particularly those from the Philippines. Its relevance to the academic discourse, pop extension services program based on the needs of the community where IMA is located. Data gathering for the research project was conducted from August 4 to September 16, 2015. Some information appearing in this research are based on what the AUSN mentors have shared in the lectures, as well as various readings. The research is focused on the knowledge since practice of the knowledge was already seldom done. The five healers in this research refers to a person who has knowledge in herbal medicine and call themselves ETA women healers. This is in contrast to the arborario who uses both herbal medicine and other me methods such as sokal and Latin prayers to heal. The study site, as shown, 
is in Sitio Matanangao in Barangay Panawang, Magagbataan. This was chosen based on its location, which is convenient for the vehicle to reach because most of the Eta community are found in the, uh, in the mountains and uh, their uh, expressed willingness to participate and also the richness of the biodiversity of the ancestral domain of the people with knowledge of indigenous healing tradition. The lady you uh, see on the slide, she is the chief uh, leader of that barangay. Her name is Shoni. Prior to the actual gathering of data, a meeting with the community was held in August 2014 at St. Francis Xavier Parish Church who adopted the community. Initially, the meeting was not intended for the thesis or study, but it was for a livelihood community project funded by the National Research Council of the Philippines. Hence, only verbal consent was obtained from the community who provided information with trust. Verbal consent from the community to conduct a livelihood project with a site inspection of the community. The main objective of the visit and site inspection as well as other guidelines were explained by yours truly through, during the initial meeting. So these are just uh, some photos with Ada during meeting and site visit. The thesis also utilizes qualitative and indigenous research methodologies to answer the proposed research questions. A review and summary of important research sources, articles, reports, and surveys on the topics was undertaken. A qualitative analysis of online and offline media sources is also used. Additionally, an extensive data collection method was used to comprise the documentary research including primary and secondary sources. Primary sources include books, journals, and articles, plus other published literature and academic critiques provided mostly by AUSN. Secondary sources include official documents and websites, plus other online sources. So the thesis is consists of 10 chapters. I've already uh, presented chapter one. Chapter two, it would focus on the history of Ata people and how colonization has impacted their lives, but very briefly, chapter three focuses on the framework and framework and literature review. It discusses anti-colonial, post-colonial, and indigenous feminism theories. These frameworks help in data analysis and gathering. The literature review discusses the healing practices of the Ata indigenous peoples in the Philippines. Chapter four is a discussion of the round table discussion or talking circle discussion methodology. It discusses how this methodology was instrumental in answering the central thesis research question. The chapter also examines how the talking methodology facilitated deeper analysis of representation from both the indigenous perspectives, the AUSN lectures on indigenous peoples, um, and the researchers' observation and personal point of views. Chapter 5 focuses on the discussion on the concept of identity by the Aita women healers. It highlights how Aita women healers talk about their identity in different categories and how they have been treated in a manner that betrays their cultural identity. Chapter 6, um, actually five, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, this all contains the results of the data gathered analysis. And on chapter 6, this focuses on the concept of agency, of eight of women healers, how they intend to make a change in both their community and the non eight people community. Chapter 7 focuses on representation. It discusses how Ata women talked about how they are being misrepresented in different aspects of life. It is within the scope that they shed light on how they want to be represented. Chapter 8 focuses on the healing practices using medicinal plants available in Sitio Matanglao. Chapter 9 focuses on the perception of Ma, 
they are maritime students, as well as the perception of the AUS and students, uh, particularly those from Unsud, Purwakita. Some of you were here, were respondents of my study. I uh, have one from Thailand, two from Bangladesh, and there are a total of uh, 57 AUSN. So raise your hand. I think Uli was, was there, right? You were there, you answered the, uh, the questionnaire. Chapter 10 includes outlines of implications of the study, summary conclusions, and recommendations. Now, what is the importance of this research? Okay, so it would answer what are the healing practices, what are the implications of the practices of IP in the academic discourse in a maritime school as map located in the province of Padan. So the purpose, to explore the healing practices, to document the resiliency and agency elements that have contributed to the continuity of this knowledge. It focuses on the healing practices of eight women healers and the lessons that we learn from them. It brings a new space of decolonization. This study how shows would show how anti-colonial, post-colonial, and indigenous feminism theories can be used to understand the eight and Filipino relations how the themes of identity, agency, and representation inform the narratives of the eight of women healers themselves. The results of this research can be described, as shown on the slide, from the perspective of the theory and the methodology which encompass use of the actual narratives of eight of women healers categorized into three themes, identity, agency, and representation. Identity. The eight women healers share their names, age, and how they acquired healing knowledge. They shared information about their ways of understanding healing, and they explained how it became their identity. They explained their worldview and how their worldview can now be considered as their identity. So later you will uh, you will see what the the narrative. No, later I I have a. Uh, written it in total, but I already translated it in English. So in a uh, concept of agency, agency for women healers is about making a change in their community which has been impacted through the work of colonization. And I have summarized it into four statements by these eight people. They said that healing is a gift from my creator and therefore I have to use it for the benefit of my community. Second, I heal because I want to improve the health of my people. Number three, healing is a means of resisting the modern way of life. And number four, my ancestors taught me how to honor other human beings. Under representation, the eight women healers want to reclaim their position as key players in the production of knowledge in the academy and at the local, national, and global public health levels. They also discuss the differences between their healing practices and those practiced by public health practitioners. They wanted to show that they also have their unique and effective ways of healing. Okay, my thesis also have identified 19 medicinal and herbal plants commonly found and used by Eta in the treatment of various sickness and also the perception of maritime students and global public health students were compared as regards their belief on traditional and health practices by the natives and if they will, if ever, will avail of their services in, get, in case they get sick. Limitation, this included a questionnaire on the perception of 56 global students and 157 maritime graduating students in year 2015 on traditional and health practices. The sample of eight communities represented by Sitio in Barangay Banawang in Bagang Pataan, with the researcher being the first to visit their community as a subject for livelihood project and research improve their quantity of life. The themes are also focused on identity, organization, and representation, and will discuss the different usual herbal medicines that have been used by the eight women healers and the different sickness they can treat. Finally, there are indigenous methodologies that is believed can be employed 
in conducting research in the indigenous community, and these methodologies are uh, are being are will be discussed in this study. Because the work is a case study, it cannot be replicated. So I I uh, I sought to attenuate this by two means. First, by making visible the words, contents, and views of the participants in their own words, which I translated in English. Second, I tried to use continued and comparative analysis to show how findings are applicable across a wide series of contexts, particularly colonial and other contexts where power and prejudice are important operational variables such as race, class, and gender. This thesis is limited also in that while I tried to triangulate with historical accounts and other data sources, my work is not fully longitudinal and therefore has the limits of all case studies. Nevertheless, in comparing their narratives to that of the views of previous authors and scholars, this study rely on the words of others which are acknowledged. For chapter two, these are the contents, backgrounder and colonization and resistance, overview of the Philippines during the pre-colonial, colonization in the Philippines and its impact on indigenous peoples, and the IP women healers. As a backgrounder, the eight in general, including their women healers, who participated in this study, are a case study in the interactive dynamics between oppression and liberation, inhumanity and irreplaceable parts of humanity which resist in the form of repression. Okay. Uh, this just shows the, uh, that there was an outbreak of uh, cholera in the Philippines from 1899 to 1903. It was the beginning of one of the most terrible epidemics of modern times, lasting until February 1904, and taking by official estimate uh, more than 109,000 lives and 4,286 in Manila. Nevertheless, despite assurances from the colonial government that Western trained doctors had the solution to this epidemic, I would just like to emphasize that the Filipinos continued to seek the help of indigenous healers during that time. Among the indigenous groups whose knowledge and healing practices were sought were Eta women healers. And Eta are one of the indigenous who resisted colonialism and ensured the preservation of their customs and character as a people. They use herbal medicine, they offer prayers to the God or Apo Diyos in healing the sick. And to the colonial government, this was unacceptable at that time. It was considered devoid of scientific rigor. Since one of the goals of the colonial government was to portray that Filipinos needed help at times, prescribed healer was the center of attention and was promptly suppressed. In other cases, the natural ritual life of the people was disrupted. The American patriotism followed a well-established set of colonial governance tactics when Spain established the Philippines as its colony. The minorization of the indigenous people started, which had uh, learned a few of the history yesterday through uh, Ronnie. They were labeled as barbarians, pagans, and all sorts of derogatory names. Soon even the assimilated Indios internalized these prejudices against indigenous people. But none of these labels characterize their real lives. They're not savage, primitive, or backward people. They only have different cultural ways of thinking, believing, feeling, and acting. They have complex social institutions and elaborate cultural traditions. Now, to provide you an overview of the Philippines during pre-colonial, it is an archipelago, Philippines, that is located a little above the equator, bounded by the Pacific Ocean, China Sea, and Celebu Sea. Consists of 7,100 islands and I islands with a total land area of 115,000 square miles. And there are three largest islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Okay. And uh, uh, they have different names, no? the ETA, IP, depending on geographical locations. For example, in Zambales, they call Ata, in Palawan, Batak, Dumagat, Sheramarde, Mamanua, in Mindanao, Negrito, in Panay, Ata, in Northeastern Luzon. Clearly, indigenous peoples in the Philippines had a meaningful life before colonialism. However, all positive attributes were dismantled 
when colonialism started to enroach on the lives of the indigenous people. Colonization the Philippines and its impact on IP. Indigenous people began to be apprehensive about the coming of the Spanish colonizers in the Philippines in the 16th century because of the enforcement of the Regalian Doctrine, which refers to the legality or claims to lands acquired by the Crown through conquest and subjugation. As a result, the indigenous peoples became aliens in their ancestral realm where their forefathers had lived and practiced their spirituality and rituals. Colonizers were determined to change their minds and hearts in order to obtain their economic power and control in the Philippines. However, IP are stronger, or indigenous peoples are stronger in reclaiming their land. They are fighting for confirmation of their rights to sovereignty and self-governance and collective ownership and processes. They seek protections for their languages, cultural and religious practices, and artifacts and their trad traditional knowledge and science. <coughs> 2.4 is about the eight of human healers. Just a very brief. The eight of human healers conceptualize that their purpose is to disseminate their knowledge of healing to those who need it. Healing is not seen as a means of attaining wealth, but rather a way of sustaining their society. It is a way of sharing a talent and bring about change in the community. It is a way to give back to both the Eta and the non-Eta community. They choose to use their own healing practices to cure their people, despite the presence of Western-style health centers and public health practitioners in their community. They share their knowledge of healing with others. <coughs> they believe in the efficacy of their healing knowledge, despite the continuing disruption by the non-Eta people. They believe that they can heal, not because of their own power, but because of the help of God. Eta, these are the Eta healing processes. They, these are predicted on the principle that healing the sick is a combination of using medicinal plants and being guided by benign spirit. This way of thinking has enabled the Eta people to understand the causes of diseases from diverse perspectives rather than from a single linear viewpoint. This has further enabled them to tackle a cause or a symptom of disease, thus assisting their people to lead healthy lives. Their belief, they believe that the spiritual and physical beings need to be cured before a person who is sick gets healed. They also believe that a person gets sick because of not respecting other creations and that before the healers can perform healing, they need to consult the spirit. This is the only time they can diagnose the cause of illness. They also believe that spirits of the land, water, trees, also help to be influential and thus must also be a peace. This is why they have a great respect both for living and non-living things. It is clear that performing a healing act is not about making a profit, but about sharing love of their people and the environment. They also believe they name a person illness without um, doubting the validity of their knowledge based on the utility of their teachings. And their knowledge of the curing power of plants cannot be disregarded. They have illustrated the utility of this knowledge to the healing of the sick. And uh, this is their healing process. Before the start of the healing, they ask God to give them wisdom so that they know which herbal medicine they should use. Diagnose and at the same time to give patients the necessary herbal medicine. Number three, heal not just the physical body but also the spiritual aspect and bring back the person into the good relationship with the other creations. These are the responsibilities of the eight of women healers. To ensure that the healing journey that requires coming to a realization about the etiological causes of giving um Prescription is taken in the right direction to let the sick person understand the process. The more an Eta performs healing, the more she realizes her intended existence because she is actualizing her communal and spiritual calling. She is not just performing duty, but instead she is leaving her assigned societal station and calling. Chapter 3 is about literature, review, and theoretical framework which contains IP in the Philippines and their knowledge of ethnomedicine, 
Trinetka Frameworks, Indigenous Feminism, Anti-Colonial Theory, and Post-Colonial Theory. This section contemplates what constitutes indigenous community. I will explain what is indigenous knowledge briefly. It also discusses knowledge of ethnomedicine and how they practice. Okay. What is indigenous knowledge? It is the body of knowledge associated with long-term occupancy of a certain place. This knowledge refers to traditional norms and social values, as well as to mental constructs that guide, organize, and regulate the people's way of living and making sense of their world. It is a sum of the experience and knowledge of a given social group and forms the basis of decision making in the face of challenges both familiar and unfamiliar. To the process of learning the old, new knowledge is discovered. This is what makes indigenous knowledge dynamic rather than study. The body of knowledge is diverse and complex given the histories, culture, and life realities of people. Indigenous knowledge are largely oral, passed on through the generations by women and men who have the trust of the elders of the community. Colonizers were determined to change the minds and hearts of the indigenous people in order to obtain their economic power and control in the Philippines. What is forgotten is that IP healing had demonstrated its efficacy even before the arrival of the enlighteners from the other side of the globe. The fact that indigenous community could survive with this healing practice attests to its efficacy. Theoretical framework, this section discusses the nature of post-colonial, anti-colonial, and indigenous feminism, theorism, and the relevance of the study. Okay. Um, Okay, 3.3 3. 3 indigenous feminism. Let me introduce the, uh, the uh, respondents or the, the, the ATA healers who were uh, interviewed or who participated and uh, who cited their, uh, who provided their insights. Okay, Anna, one of the ATA healers who participated in the RTD. When we ATA women healers gather at night to sing a song and tell a story, she said that we also talk about issues in the society. There are so many, like the issue of the color of our skin, the notion that women like us are submissive to our husband, our government who do not really protect us, companies that come and take our plants and ask us the use of them, and afterwards use them to make money and many more issues. These issues have been there, so the question is, Okay, so that is what she said. She's, uh, what we do now? We realize that we need friends to help us fight against these problems. So you, Angelica, we trust you, having visited us and provided a livelihood project and seminar workshops, we enjoyed the activity. You, you may not get data, but we believe that the information we have shared with you, you may be able to write about them to educate others and or come up with another proposal that would help better improve our quality of life. So the eight of women healers were aware of my privilege as a director of MAA with programs that extend community outreach and also connected with AUSN in the USA and they felt comfortable. So they're not threatened by it because they understand. These women understand that knowledge is power and they know that combining their ways of knowing with the knowledge from an academy like AUSN who supports IP studies is a start of the victory against culturally attrition forces. Through this study, it is a way for them to reach out to other people who believe and acknowledge their healing practices and existence. On anti-colonial theory, this teaches us how to resist oppression, assimilation, and annihilation by encouraging us to alternate knowledge, oral histories, literatures, and cultural products as a counterpart to hegemonic forms of knowledge. This also, the theory also encourages the colonized bodies and communities to define themselves and to articulate their condition to their own voice. Captures the importance of indigenous knowledge in the academy as well as the anti-colonial struggle against imperialism, racism, sexism, impoverishment, homophobia, and other forms of colonial domination. 
post-colonial theory and its political practices seeks to build on rich inheritance and the racial legacy of its political determination as well, its refusal to accept the status quo, its transformation of its demologies, its establishment of new forms of discursive and political power. It does not mean that post-colonial theory forgets colonization. Its focus is instead to look at the impact of colonialism at the present time by considering the past. So uh, methodology, indigenous research defined, indigenous methodology, uh, my accountability, accountability to the researcher, by meeting with the ETA community, <coughs> the um, methodologies of uh, ETA Manilers and data collection. Okay, so I'll uh, be answering two questions. Okay, what is indigenous research and how do we know if the research method is appropriate to whom is the research uh, accountable? The methodology is geared, let me define indigenous research. The methodology is geared towards not only addressing the issue of the exclusion of women's knowledge production, but also privileging their agency and resilience in the midst of colonization. The Aita people know the plan and my good intention. That is why when they first saw me in their community, they already knew that I wanted to hear their story and to get any information that they may share with me that are not found in books. And they, the same may be formed part of my write-up for projects beneficial to the community as partner of Ma'a. So in doing this research, this is the only time that I have encountered that uh, there is such a term known called as indigenous research. Then there is also the term indigenous methodology. This is about fulfilling, fulfilling our obligations to our relationship to the research and to the indigenous people. In order to fulfill this responsibility, it is important that the main features of indigenous research methodology are adhered to. And these are the main features of indigenous research methodology, which I will not discuss here. But uh, these, all these uh, principles, features, I have utilized in this research to gain trust from the community. Okay. My accountability, so I believe I'm accountable to the eight of women healer practitioners. I was transparent about my objectives in visiting them. Okay, as I introduce myself and the institution I'm representing. And I, um, okay, so everything, okay, just uh, show you my first meeting. In fact, I thought that I was helping them when my intention is good to provide livelihood projects, but I felt that it is the IT community who helped me finish a thesis related to ITS and public health in due time because I, uh, I have documented all of those. So uh, there were five Ito Women Healers practitioners who I did discuss and shared stories with in separate occasion, and the five Ito members were visited a couple of times based on planned dates, and I provided them a recap, and I validated what they have told me. If I, uh, what I have told them, it's just pilot testing a questionnaire, but this one, it's validating if what I have uh, noted is correct or not. So the study is about the life of Ato Liban, therefore it is right for me to refrain in my research methodology according to what they wanted, because initially I planned it individual and also by group, but I, I found that it's, it's better not to discuss using a talking circle method, because that's what they want. Okay, now here are their narrations. So the eight of women healers stated that as much as they can heal others, they need healing as well, and they can do this in a talking circle. This is where they express the pains that they are currently experiencing. Sima, one of the eight of women healers, states on a talking circle, I feel good because in here I can talk and share good and bad experiences outside my community. Like when they see me outside, I heard them saying insulting words on how I look differently from them. I'm sharing this story with others, pouring out all the emotions, and I feel good. Now, the talking circle follows the work of anti-colonial, post-colonial, and indigenous feminist theories because it is about promoting self-determination, listening, 
acknowledgement of the voices of the Eta women healers and recognition that they too are part of the production of knowledge. Okay. For the data collection, I believe that the Eta women healers have faith, have faith that I'm going to retain the information with appropriate interpretive with a way of, for the rest of my life. I took this as experience and analyze and document them so we may provide good community outreach activities for them. And these experiences have shaped my way of theorizing, theorizing, writing, and researching about indigenous peoples when I'm advised by AUSN to prepare for my defense. Since AUSN is on bioethics and global public health, these thesis have been prepared and submitted with hope that this study will not only change, challenge our way of thinking about the ATA community, but that it will also reorient our Eurocentric gaze with respect to indigenous contributions to the political arena and public health. So uh, chapter five is a concept on identity, who are they, race as an identity, gender as an identity, and their worldview as a source of identity. So there were five women ETA healers who participated. Okay, this section avails information. So I'll introduce them to you one by one. So to protect the anonymity of participants, I use pseudonyms. I use Anna, Bea, Sima, Dina, and Ella. A, B, C, D, E. Anna, she is 56 years old. She inherited her healing practices from her mother. At the time of the study, she had been a healer for 30 years. When her mother was alive, she used to help her in the healing processes. Her mother taught her how to heal the sick. In her healing practices, she uses herbal medicine and rituals. And this is what she said. My mother is my role model. She taught me how to be a good doctor, a good member of the community. She taught me how to perform my responsibility well. She told me that healing is very important, not just for, my, for our own self, but also for other human beings. She said that if I want to see the next generation of Ita, I had to learn how to heal. And I had to learn the different herbal plants and how to prepare them and the different illnesses that can be healed using herbal plants. I am happy when people get well after I treated them. I do not ask for money in exchange for my services. I heal because of my ayat. Ayat means love. That's their uh, term for uh, love for my people. However, if they decide to go and seek another treatment like medical doctor, I'm happy with that. To me, when people came and asked for help, I cannot say no. I have to help and do my best to render my service. Healing is a way for me to contribute the legacy of my mother. I do not want my people to suffer. I try my best to help them. These are moments that I get very tired, but I know that if I do not carry out my responsibility to my community and to my people, I will not feel good. Healing is a gift from my Creator, and therefore I have to use it for the benefit of my community. Next is Bea. Bea is 62 years old. She used to get sick when she was young, and it is true that this that she became a healer. At the time of the study, she had been a healer for 40 years. She uses herbal plants and rituals in healing. And she recalls, When I was young, I wondered why my body was always sensitive. And because of this, I always felt sick. My parents used to bring me to an Eta healer. The healer was all, always nice to me. Every time she performed healing rituals, I made sure that I paid attention. When she was preparing medicine for me, I would always ask questions. I remember one time she asked me why I needed to know everything, and I told her that I did not want her to get tired of me, so when I get sick again, I would be the one to heal myself. The healer laughed at, uh, laughed at me, but at the time, I was already claiming my position in this society as a healer. Since then, I became a healer. When I do not feel good, I treat myself. This practice continued, and people started coming to me and asking me to heal them. The third is Sima. She is uh, 39 years of age. She inherited her healing practices from her grandmother. At the time of the study, she had been a healer for 13 years. 
She uses herbal medicine and prayers and healing. Sima notes, being healer is not easy. I do it because I want to have a reason to live. My grandmother used to tell me that we had an immense talent and said that the only way to maintain it was to use it. She told me that my gift was healing and therefore I had to use it in a good way. My grandmother taught me almost everything I know in healing. She taught me very important values in life, emphasizing that we are all connected and that if one is sick, we are all affected. Therefore, to avoid this, we have to do our part. Fourth is Dina. Dina is 66 uh, years of age. She inherited her healing from her mother. And at the time of study, she had been a healer for 41 years. She uses herbal medicine and prayer for healing. Dina talks about the importance of prayer in her healing practices. Before I heal, she said, I ask God to give me the wisdom and knowledge. I know that without the guidance of my Creator, I would not be able to do it. My healing is useless if I do not pray for it. I know well that I am just an instrument of my God. Thus, before I heal, I ask for help and acknowledge that I cannot do it myself. I also get my strength from prayers. My faith in God is the one that sustains me in my healing. And last is Ella. Ella is 51 years of age. She inherited her healing knowledge from her parents at the time of the study. She had been a healer for four years. She uses herbal medicine and she shares her, ex uh, the, her negative experiences that she had when she went to the health center. She said, when I was sick, I went to the health center to get treatment. I was expecting good treatment because I was sick. When I got to the health center, I approached one of the nurses and I asked if I could see the doctor. She told me that I should wait for my turn. I waited and waited. After waiting for half the day, I could not take it anymore. So I approached the nurse again. This time, she told me that the doctor had left and that I should go home and come back another time. I was very upset and I became sicker. I had waited for two hours just to go to the health center. When I went back home, I told my parents what had happened and they informed me that we do not usually get good treatment from the NAA people. Following that experience, I asked my parents to teach me how to heal. So uh, let me present race as an identity. Race as an identity that has been questioned and undermined. Race is a socially constructed ideology and becomes a dominant factor in realizing the ideology of expansionism and imperialism which extricates the Eta way of life. In these circumstances, race has become a sentence for some and a privilege to others. In the talking circle, Sima, one of the Eta healers, states as regards identity. Filipinos stare at us in a very offensive way. They judge us on the basis of the color of our skin and texture of hair. This time, the lighter your complexion, the better the position you will have in the society. Also, we do not have education that is Eurocentric in nature. However, we are educated by our ancestors. They taught us how to love the nature and other human beings. We believe that plants and animals possess the spirit. Therefore, they deserve to be treated well. We were taught how to read and write with our own alphabet. We were taught how to be sensitive to science before everything happens in this world. Science must come first. We were taught how to be analytical, respectful, and most of all, to recognize the existence of our Creator. Now the people who do not know us think and continue thinking that we are useless race. But I believe that time will come when our true identity will be revealed and these people will be educated. Okay. So gender as an identity. So in the eyes of numerous colonized people, the work of the Eta healers is not scientific because they do not use technology or instruments to restore the health of a person. They are not considered professional if they have not undertaken the Western curricular training related to curing diseases. But healing is not about, all about curing the illness. It is also about identity. Not everybody can be a healer. For this reason, the uniqueness of eight of women healers makes them the most cohesive and effective mentors in the society 
and they're in the adhesive elements of the community's social fabric. The Eta women healers do not see themselves as different from the Eta men in terms of social, political, economic, cultural, and spiritual location. From a social perspective, the Eta women healers have been acting as speakers or representatives for their community. Ella, for example, represented her people in the municipal town hall, documenting that Sitio Matanglao is their ancestral land. The Eta women healers are also intra-communally, politically engaged. One even ran for a consular position during the municipal election. Economically, Eta cohort has equal decision-making power with their husbands with respect to how and where to spend familiar resources. With respect to both cultural and spiritual location, the Eta women perform their healing practices in the community with the support of their husband or fathers. Now, how about their world of view as a source of identity? The Eta women healers have particular and culturally informed ways of interpreting the world. They want to make it clear that their perception is that only way of perceiving the events that are happening in the world. They recognize other ways of interpreting different phenomena. They want to share their worldview for others to know and they sincerely hope that they will be heard. These healers name their worldview as their identity because it is that which differentiates them from the non eta people and their identity also describes their healing beliefs and practices. Let us hear from Dina. She says, My healing practice is not only about healing the physical body of a human being. It is also about healing the spirit and the emotional aspect of a person. For us, everything is interconnected. We are all connected to the land and to the spirit world. For me, if we disrespect the spirit world, then it brings illness and we are not well. <clears throat> to me, healing is bringing awareness to others that they need to pray, or rather to pay great respect to the things that they do not see. Bea also explains, I heal because I want my people to be well. And as much as they are well, I have to constantly tell them that they need to learn how to heal because everything is constantly changing in a cyclical, cyclical way. What I mean by this is that I may not be here anymore and there are still people who may need help. So if they learn how to heal, then they can continue my work. I also tell my children that the world is constantly changing. So they have to pay attention to what is happening in the present time because this has something to do with the future. So with that narration, it shows that Bea knows what is happening that uh, it can affect the future. It is therefore important to transfer her healing knowledge to others and hence ensure that their healing practices will be sustained. Under the concept of agency, these are the, uh, the summary. You know? I am the light of my family and my community. Heal because I want to improve the health of my people. Healing as a means of resisting the modern way of life. My ancestors taught me how to honor our human beings. So uh, they possess knowledge. Okay. Required to fabricate stronger relationship with the others in terms of social agency. This is done through healing the they do this through healing non ATA people without discriminating them. So even if they're non ATAs, they they also heal. Okay, even uh, they these non ATA people called they ridicule them in return. So my thesis is not only about rewriting the text, but also about providing the voices of the eight women healers. Because that in, all, in that way, we can hear their voice, feel their emotions, and pay attention to the message in their statement. As regards, I am the light of my family and my community. Ella says, I love serving my family and my community. To me, when I do things for my family and my community, I feel good. Because I know that those little things I do, I can help them. Okay. So, uh, the same with uh, Anna. As a woman, when there is conflict, I stand in the middle to ask the people what their concern is and whether it is necessary to resolve it by, bit, 
treating each other in a peaceful and respectful manner. In my house, there are times when other members of the family become angry. So instead of getting angry, I talk in a way that the other person feels loved and respected. In my community, when I heal, I let the person know that I'm there for her or him. Okay. With Anna, so uh, I heal because I want to improve the health of my people. So that's what she said. Other healing as a means of resisting the modern way of life. Okay. First, it is personal experience and negative experience. That is why uh, atheists resist modern models of life and healing. And second, they want to demonstrate their healing practice, that it is beneficial to all, and they do not want to be manipulated and act as pawns in games directed by global marketing, or global marketing rather, and corporate health agendas. Professor Master, do I continue? Uh, your, your conclusion stop, please. Okay. So, uh, the, the, these are uh, for representation. That's the content, indigenity, and language privacy. Okay. Yes. So, um, that is what they say, which I will not discuss anymore. As, uh, but just to show you, spirituality during Spaniards. Huh? Okay. Ayat means love. This is indigenous healing versus public health practice. Okay. They work on the basis of the world review. So I also compared IP and uh, public health practice. Okay. Public health practice. Okay, as much as okay. That's the public health practice, but uh, Different as well. The medicinal plants, I will discuss that uh, in the next uh, day. So let me skip that one. And then uh, go to the. Uh, so you see, there are 19. I'm skipping all the slides. There are 19 slides the, the, the various diseases that are being treated and the scientific name and the uh, how they uh, prepare the. The medicinal plants, okay. Do I present the perception of MAP and the AUS students? Not anymore, okay. These are the profile, the pro uh, whether it's perceived or not perceived as useful, okay. We have consulted at the healer when sick, okay. We see at for consultation. This is for respect for wanting to try consulting an IT healer. This is for not wanting to try consulting an IT healer. Between a native or IT healer and a medical practitioner, which of the two would you feel comfortable consulting? And the answer is, the winner is, of course, medical practitioner. Okay. Have you ever talked to a native or an IT healer? Yes or no? It was easier to talk a native or IT healer. Medical practitioner is easy to talk to rather than the indigenous. That's, um, so perception. Okay. Reasons for going to native or IP healers rather than medical or public health practitioners. These are the top reasons. Cheaper, cost-effective, affordable. They use natural herbal medicine, convenient, accessible, effective, easy to talk to, approachable, and other uh, other reasons, which I know that. Okay, discussion, summary, conclusion, and recommendations. So what's its implication to map extension services program? Okay, so uh, because of the, uh, the data generated, we'll be able to uh, further enhance our extension services program. And um, we will be providing more seminar workshops for the IPs, okay, and more livelihood projects. Implication to academic discourse at MAP and higher learning. It highlighted and documented the knowledge of the ATO with respect to healing, physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being, and documented also cultural richness of the ATO women healers. Okay. It casts an inquiry into our own ethical understanding and the idea that we have been inclusive. It asks us to acknowledge that ATO women healers have the right to as both an ethical matter and one of the rigorous scholarship. <coughs> Determine how they want to have a conversation with researchers such as myself and there are the subjects. 
The study also highlights the need for researchers who undertake studies in indigenous communities to respect their culture and practices and to be sensitive to their beliefs. It also highlights how post-colonial and anti-colonial theories and indigenous feminist framework inform the eight of women healers, identity, agency, and representations. Implications of bioethics in the Asia-Pacific region. There is no question there is, that there is a dire need for bioethics education through the, throughout the Asia-Pacific region, particularly in the Philippines. That studies on IP are now incorporated in the elementary and secondary curriculum in the Philippines. However, the introduction of bioethics as part of the curriculum is not yet institutionalized. It is hoped that this subject could be introduced even in secondary or introductory role to a wider audience at an early age. Conclusion it is important that we stop excluding certain people from the knowledge production area now, simply because they do not originate geographically or paradigmatically in zones or interests from which we come. Consider that their healing practices help not only their own people, but also the non eta people in healing their physical, emotional, social, and spiritual illness, Know that through their healing wisdom, they may have been able to sustain their resilience and their race will continue despite the assimilation and colonization process that incessantly intrudes their community. Remember that they are human, highly intelligent and understand life and nature, including the dynamics of power, assimilation, knowledge production, and the healing power of caring. So what might academic discourse need to learn from the narrative? In this study, the Ito Women Healers are informing us that as scholars, we should, you, we should see knowledge. Not from, but from one, but multiple dimensions of interactions and consequences. So it may be useful recast if we alter our perspectives or paradigms. And recommendations. On theories, post-colonial, anti-colonial, and indigenous feminist theories have helped to theorize, theorize the life experiences of the Aita women healers. In this study, these frameworks were valuable both in the elucidation of the agency of the women healers, illuminating how the Aita women healers view the world. On methodology, in terms of methodology, the study recommends that future researchers allow participants to engage in the selection of methodology so that it is appropriate to them. In this particular study, it is a talking circle, but it might be different from another community. So they must be involved. It mirrors emergent discourses between uh, governments, non-government organizations, and native people. Doing this gives them the power to set the rules in a way that respects and recognizes their culture and traditions, unilaterally setting the methodology for indigenous participants, brings back memories of power and control that underlie colonization. Thank you. We have to answer the question. Yeah. It's on local public health. This is a national public health on global public health, on giving back to the community, on future projects, okay? So, too long. But this is the words of wisdom which I'd like to share, which I translated. The Eta women said, uh, let's love each other so that there will always be peace in our nation. That ends my very long presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Uli, please. Okay. Come and use the mic, please, for the Skype people. It's easier. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Angelier, Dr. Angelica. Um, I'm listening to your presentation so I can conclude that uh, the, the problem facing by the 
traditional healing is almost the same with Indonesia. So it is a lack of recognition from the the government or medical <coughs> uh, sector. And because the Ida healing is uh, related to the belief or uh, norm or faith, do you think that it is one of of the barrier that such healing cannot be uh, cannot uh, what I say yeah cannot be accepted uh, yeah uh, medically or based on uh, knowledge or based on science do you think so okay thank you. Um, so the question is uh, if uh, being uh, religious uh, is a barrier, barrier, the reason why the government does not accept the uh, yeah? um, I don't think so. I think uh, it's, it's not that. It's the scientific reason. Uh, before the government or before uh, any agencies accept um, that this uh, particular plant really heals or treats a certain sickness, it goes through a scientific process. That's why we have chemists, chemistry, chemist, biochemist. Like, uh, for example, myself, I'm a biochemist. I'm a chemist, uh, really by profession. And my expertise is on the uh, mutagenicity. I have to check whether that plant really cures, but what about if it affects other, uh, other uh, or it would have a side effect. Who knows if it can cause cancer? Because uh, although, uh, you know, um, plants, it can treat this, but it can also uh, harm you in some other way. There might, must be, there might be some toxic or some mutagenicity effect, mutagenic effect rather, on that plant. So uh, that's why we have Department of Science and Technology, we have Department of Health. So, and now, uh, based on, uh, but I did not discuss it anymore, but I, uh, but tomorrow you will see the scientific names of the medicinal plants because when I went to the to the community, I identified 19 plants. We whose name is similar to other um, other uh, communities, but I mean uh, it's different from the other uh, other other uh, community of IPs, but using scientific name, it's the same. It just comes in a different name. So, uh, um, so meaning, if there's a scientific name, there are uh, journals or scientific studies uh, proving on the authenticity or the, the effects in, uh, the, of that the particular plant. Like, uh, um, in the Philippines, we have uh, the, uh, give me one. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, the Gundi, right? Used to cure fever. Now you can buy the Gundi in capsules because it already uh, was subjected to scientific uh, testing. Okay, so uh, I think religion is not is not a question because it's always good to pray. Even uh, even if we come from different nations, different countries, I think we have the same God. It just comes in a different name. Because we all, all of us have different language, different dialects, and different beliefs and culture. Yeah. But, but the Eta healing is uh, legally granted in the Philippines? Again? So the healing is set by legally granted by the government? It's a guaranteed by the government? Yes, you will see a uh, mark. It's uh, BFAT approved, meaning uh, it's approved by the Bureau Bureau of uh, Food and Drugs Authority Authority Regulation uh, Authority. So there's an uh, approval because sometimes you know in the community uh, that's why the scientists they go to the community. That's why I was there because I'm a scientist. I'm with the National Research Council of the Philippines. So I was fascinated with the, the plants, so I brought them there. And uh, um, that's why I, I, I got some information from them, because I have plants in to, to transform those plants into, uh, into capsules like that. Okay, yes, please don't open. 
Yeah, but, um, good morning everybody. Thank you for your presentation. Do you want to use the microphone? Donovan from Indonesia. Well, um, thank you for the time for BSN. Um, this is like kind of contribution. In my country, in especially in my village, in Mentawai, we have indigenous people and they're doing the same things that you have presented. So, um, I'd like to ask you, um, before uh, the the doctor, I mean the traditional doctor there, they are going to find plants uh, before before coming to, to help the, the sick people. So they said, we, we, call, we call them sikere. So they said, someone telling us, the ancestor, someone telling us to get this plant, this plant, this plant, don't get this plant, and then this one, it's in logically, right? So um, in my university, Bukur Kagasan University, Faculty of Forestry, they are doing scientific research, like what you have said, um, in biochemistry, right? Scientific research to find what um, biochemical component on there, and according to me, it will make it. It will trouble their the the community. So, would you like to come and to make research in my country? This is confirmation. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm no longer practicing my uh, my profession as a scientist, but because I want to practice once I graduate AUSN. I will practice to be a bioethics expert and a public health expert and come up with a book co-authored with, uh, of course, that's my dream, uh, to be, uh, with, uh, of course, with the guidance of Professor Masser, who has written a lot of uh, bioethics books. In fact, I was inspired. I just, uh, I was inspired by uh, this uh, AUSN when I joined the, um, the, uh, um, this is a lecture, lecture and uh, the uh, conference held in Arizona, USA. Most of you are here, you were there. And uh, I was invited as visiting professor, not as a student. But since I was there for six weeks, unofficial trip, I, I enjoyed listening to the professor, listening to Professor Master. So I was, you know, I was so amazed. Uh, with the IP, with the study about IP. So when I get back to the Philippines, since I'm in charge of extension services program, I try to go to the AITA community because my boss said, what is it for us? And since we are maritime school, then I explain. And my, my president is a good president. He has a heart. So uh, he loves the community. Okay, okay, go ahead. So he supports. So uh, I went to the community because for, for every, uh, you see, for every opportunity, for every uh, privileges, there is a corresponding responsibility that goes with it. So I, I, I would consider my meeting uh, being connected with AUSN, being a part of the Navajo and the Apache tribes, who were also my classmates, like Lian, Andrea, I, and I went also to Unsud, for Wakato, we went to Bando. So I developed this uh, respect and love for uh, bioethics and uh, bioethics and uh, public health, because initially I wanted to be a doctor, but because of uh, some reasons, but there is a reason for everything. But and so your question is, if I go to Indonesia, um, I hope so, but probably uh, not anymore because uh, I am not practicing my. I yes, Ronnie. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mom, for the presentation. Actually, I thought I'm not in a thesis presentation. I thought I was in a book lunching. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, it was really enriching for me as a person working with indigenous communities. Um, I would just like to suggest, Mom, if you could consider on the next steps on your uh, proposal and the next steps that you could also 
uh, at document other indigenous knowledge of other indigenous peoples in the Philippines. For the information of everyone, the Philippines has 117 indigenous peoples and each speaks 117 different languages and dialects. So we are very rich in culture in the Philippines. So hopefully you could consider also having research on other indigenous knowledge. Yes, actually, this would be a longitudinal study because it doesn't mean that if I uh, already uh, defended my thesis, that would stop. <laughs> you know, it's a continuous. So, meaning now that I'm an expert because of the study that I have done, and thank you to AUSN, then it means that uh, this could be uh, for others to emulate or to, uh, to serve as reference and uh, guidance for uh, for future uh, researches okay